Hi everyone, Andy here. Welcome to the Crypto Wealth Cafe. It is time for our weekly look at the markets. Time to do what we always do at the beginning of the show, which is put the kettle on, make yourself a nice strong cup of coffee, or perhaps a relaxing cup of tea, or if it's after dark where you are, something stronger perhaps, a nice dram of single malt. Sounds pretty good to me. Uh, let's get into it, eh? So if we start over here at a coin market cap, we can see Bitcoin, 39,745, Ethereum, almost down to 3,000. So yeah, a little bit of a, you know, we talked about last week about the, the calm before the storm, a volatility was incoming. We thought maybe there'd be some volatility to the upside, perhaps some good news coming out of the Bitcoin conference. Um, well, you know, we did get that volatility, but we're down. We're down 13% down from where we were last week uh, for Bitcoin and 12% uh, down for Ethereum. I mean, it's not unique to crypto. It is just a volatile time in the world, as I'm sure you've noticed. Uh, we'll talk about a bit more about that soon. Um, yeah, I mean, it is what it is. So obviously, Crypto Fear and Greed Index, this won't be good. No, of course, back to extreme fear. We're just a, a, a volatile, fickle a bunch, us crypto investors, aren't we? So look, you know, um, that is to be expected if the price is going to drop, uh, you know, 13, 14% on the week. Of course, the fear and greed index will go right back down to extreme fear. All right, so on the Bitcoin chart, this is what it looks like. So again, that's the, the this red candle here is uh, is really the the steep drop, and here as well. Uh, I mean, we were looking good. We were sort of just uh, as we always uh, talk about, you know, for most of this year, we've just been kind of ranging along in this range, and then we started to break up the top, and we were looking good for a while, but bang, downhill since then. However, I mean. You know, if we zoom out a bit, um, I guess, look, look, let's just look at some quick charts from uh, me old mate Dave the Wave, renowned technical analyst, because he has a way of putting these things into perspective. So, you know, Dave says, good news is that it's, it's bang on a full year since uh, the first uh, peak, which was really uh, April last year. So that's a year ago up here. And, you know, there is an argument to be made we've kind of been in a corrective market uh, since then. Now, Dave was always projecting a an eventual correction to around $25,000 down here, which didn't quite get to that first time. He's saying we may still uh, go back down there uh, now. And interesting says Dave that the top of the long term long term uh, growth channel buy zone a base is thirty thousand dollars at the end of this year as compared to twenty thousand at the beginning of the year so what he's talking about is when we talk about the the buy zone the buy zone is this shaded area at, at, at I guess the the bottom of this channel or logarithmic growth chart that that uh, Dave has has charted out so essentially any time that Bitcoin has been in this zone historically that has been an excellent place uh, to buy uh, your Bitcoin if it's kind of right up at the top of the channel up here <clears throat> that's well, it's not such a good uh, place to buy Bitcoin. It will be in the long term, sure. Uh, but, you know, the value buys uh, are certainly down here in this shaded area. So the question of the day is, as you can see, we're really at the middle of the zone at the moment. Are we headed back for a visit to the buy zone? So while, uh, you know, that will be... <clears throat> If we do get back there, it'll be doom and gloom. It won't feel good. People will be scared. There'll be blood in the streets. Sentiment will be dire. People will talk about the death of Bitcoin, the death of crypto. You won't feel like buying any. But that is actually, of course, the time that you should buy some. So just something to keep in mind uh, as we go forward. If we if we do get down here, I don't think it will stay there for long because a lot of people will be seeing that as an excellent buying opportunity. If you do have your long-term wealth builder uh, mindset happily uh, in place, then 
plan ahead. You know, that is going to be an excellent buy zone. Ten years' time, uh, you know, that uh, you'll look back and think, what an excellent opportunity that was. I'm glad I took that opportunity. Or you may not have taken that opportunity. It's up to you. So sometimes it's good to plan ahead and be prepared because it can be harder to make these decisions um, in the heat of the moment. All right. It's just another. So here's the kind of the zoomed out version of uh, Dave the Waves uh, logarithmic growth channel. So you can see. So the buy zone is really just above the the bottom line here. So you can see again what we're talking about. It's it's where you want to be buying your Bitcoin now. Back here, which was um, you know 2014, 2016 even early 2017, so, you, you know, in that sort of last uh, long, really long bear market back here, you had a, a, a an excellent, uh, excellent spot to accumulate Bitcoin, but of course, you know, this is five years ago, not all of us are, were around then and accumulating Bitcoin, but those that did, well, they've done extremely well. Then 2018, a bear market was kind of crashed down uh, early 19, 2019 again, Great opportunity there, and of course the same thing in 2020, uh, the COVID, the first COVID crash, again, bang, straight down into the buy zone. So probably going to get less and less opportunities over time as the market matures. Uh, we won't get the sudden crashes. Um, it'll be increasingly liquid. Um, so you got to take those, uh, take advantage of those buying opportunities when they do present themselves, uh, or just buy a little bit every week or every month or or whatever you do um so yeah simple as that really hope that uh just puts things into a little bit of a perspective in the meantime you know we said that the world is a little bit of a volatile place at the moment which is not helping markets it's not helping uh stocks or equities or bonds or gold or crypto uh, everything is is suffering a little bit at the moment um one of the reasons for that is inflation. So the CPI uh, numbers, consumer price index in the US, those numbers came in uh, today, 8.5% um, increase um, year on year in the CPI, which is uh, the highest in four decades. So, I mean, that's pretty grim, <laughs> really. Um, yeah, so I thought this was funny. This is a, um, this is a, what do you call it, uh, the menu. This is the McDonald's menu. I think this is in the US, but um, it, it, it'll demonstrate uh, things quite nicely, I think. So if we look back, at, now this is the 1970s, right? So what's on the menu at McDonald's in the 1970s? Well, you've got all your old favorites. You've got the quarter pounder with cheese, 70 cents US. Regular quarter pounder without the cheese, cheese is 60 cents. A Big Mac, that'll run you 65 cents. A cheeseburger, 33 cents. And, um, you know, you get French fries, 26 cents. Um, so, yeah. Um, 50 years ago, uh, that's how much prices have increased. Um, a lot. Question, of course, is have your wages increased by that much? Short answer, no. I guess the scary thing is, well, you know, what will prices be in 50 years from now? What will a Big Mac cost 50 years from now? Will it, a $50 Big Mac, does that even make sense? That's inflation. All right, uh, what else is going on in the world? Well, nothing good, you know, uh, Ukraine, we don't want to talk about Ukraine, but uh, Ukraine is really contributing to global volatility in all sorts of ways um, and of course COVID just drags on I mean most of the rest of the world is kind of trying to live with COVID as best they can now uh, apart from of course in China so you've probably seen have you seen Shanghai pretty much completely locked down uh, other parts of China as well and I mean no one does a lockdown like China really pretty grim stuff you can't leave your apartment uh in, in shanghai 
there's food shortages. Um, of course, this has incredible knock-on effects for the global economy as well, just in terms of the supply chains. The, the, the ships can't port, can't, they can't enter the port in Shanghai to either unload or load up. So, you know, we talked about this uh, weeks and weeks ago that, uh, yeah, China's uh, ongoing lockdowns would lead to, yeah, just more issues with these supply chains, and, and that's just starting to play out. Have you seen the footage of the drones? I just, this is quite amazing stuff. So, here's a, here's a drone in Shanghai. Yes, yeah, so that's a robot dog drone. They just roam around the streets telling citizens to go back and get inside uh, their houses. This is a famous one as well. It's at night, so you can't see it as well. Um, but see, these, these drones, they're flying around uh, outside the apartment buildings, and this one is literally saying uh, to the citizens, please comply with COVID restrictions. Control your soul's desire for freedom. Do not open the window or sing. Yeah, quite frightening, quite dystopian. Um, so I don't mean to dwell on this, just um, it's a crazy old world. It is a crazy old world. Right. Now, you recall last week we talked a bit about uh, the big Bitcoin 2022 conference, and it was a massive conference. There were uh, some great announcements, uh, lots of interesting tidbits that came out of it, but nothing game-changing, nothing revolutionary, certainly nothing uh, to move the market at all. But I said we'd just go through a couple of the talking points, so I'll, I'll do that very quickly. Uh, President Bukali, of course, um, of uh, El Salvador, he had hoped he was going to be one of the keynote speakers at the conference, but unfortunately he, he didn't make it, and the reason was, well, he posted, he posted this statement saying, Hello, friends of the Bitcoin conference. Even though we're in an existential battle and an, an inflection point of civilization, humans need a time to gather, celebrate victories, and remember what makes us human. A lot has happened since the last conference, and it was my sincere hope to celebrate our collective victories with another a new announcement. Alas, this could not be. I have made the hard decision to cancel my participation in the conference due to unforeseen circumstances in my home country. Now, so what it, what's happened is, you may be aware of this, but El Salvador has a terrible problem with gang violence, has for a long time, and yeah, just uh, it's escalating at the moment. So uh, President of El Salvador elected to stay home and uh, just make sure he's on the ground there trying to uh, look after the people uh, against the gang. So, you know, fair enough. Um, you cannot... Uh, yeah, you cannot criticize him for, for doing that. Uh, there were other announcements, though. So Samson Mao, who is, you know, he's been part of the uh, the team that have helped uh, El Salvador transition to uh, the early stages of becoming a, uh, a Bitcoin economy. He used to be a head of strategy at Blockstream, but he's he's left Blockstream and set up a, a new company. It's called uh, Jan3. This is the website. It's called Jan3, I believe, just because Jan3 is the date that the um, Bitcoin blockchain first went live back in um, 2009, is that right, 2009, I think so, so uh, yeah, Jan 3, and the purpose of Jan 3 is simply to accelerate nation state Bitcoin adoption, uh, pretty lofty goal, so he, so Samson talked at the conference, and he just named uh, three new jurisdictions that are at different stages uh, on uh, along their journey or path to uh, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Uh, so one was the Caribbean island Arotan, which is part of Honduras. Um, one was Madeira, which is uh, an autonomous region of uh, Portugal. And the other is uh, Mexico. So Mexico are, are looking at this as well. So... Again, no major kind of announcements, but it's just 
the dominoes are starting to fall just one by one slowly but surely this stuff always happens faster than uh, you might think uh, but at the time when you wa were watching it day to day we're kind of waiting uh, for these things to happen but you know 10 years time we'll look back and it will have all happened very quickly so uh, Samson Mao as this is his business card uh, as uh, Gen 3 and well, I think that's pretty good. That's a that's a it's a bold statement of a, a business card, nation state Bitcoin a, adoption. And <laughs> there's been a few memes and so on. Uh, do you know Pip, who Patrick Bateman is? Uh, of course, the uh, the lead character in American Psycho, uh, played by Christian Bale in the movie. And there's the the famous scene in the book, uh, and it was in the movie as well. Uh, where uh, Patrick Bateman uh, gets uh, jealous of his uh, colleague's uh, business card. Well, they all get their business cards out and uh, compare, compare the fonts and the embossing and the paper stock and all that kind of stuff. So just funny to see uh, some memes around that because you got to say that is a badass uh, business card. And so funnily enough, you know, speaking of uh, psychopaths, uh, which Patrick Bateman was... Um, New York Post put out an article just today, it's a little bit clickbaity, I must say, saying that Bitcoin fans are psychopaths who don't care about anyone. I'm mildly offended by that, but we'll have a look at it in a, in a second. But of course, so Samson Mao uh, just uh, riffing on uh, that psychopath uh, comparison indeed. It says, look at the subtle colouring on my business card, the tasteful thickness, my god, it even has a watermark. So, yeah, I thought that was amusing. This is the New York Post article. It is clickbaity. They say that the average Bitcoin investor is a calculating psychopath with an inflated ego. A team of experts surveyed more than 500 people to uncover the personality traits most common among crypto nuts. So as soon as they use the term uh, crypto nut, I tend to think that I'm going to take the article less seriously because this is obviously, um, as I say, I think clickbait is a kind word, but we'll leave it at that. Originally appeared on The Sun, so I'm not going to pass judgment on The Sun, it's up to you whether you find The Sun and the New York Post a reputable media source in these troubling media times. Instead, we'll move on. Still at the Bitcoin conference, uh, Peter Thiel. Um, I'm sure you know who Peter Thiel is, a venture capitalist, one of the richest men in the world. Um, libertarian, uh, contrarian, controversial. Um, but he had a good speech. He talked about, um, he referred to Warren Buffett as a sociopathic grandpa from Omaha, uh, which I enjoyed. I mean, that's a <laughs> delicious turn of phrase mildly insulting of course but I guess it gets the headlines um, here's a piece on it so um, it, really what Peter Thiel was talking about is he was talking about um, some of these the big the big guys in finance the the heads of the big banks uh, people like Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett and he's talking about how they were kind of holding Bitcoin back and purposefully uh, trying to slow Bitcoin's adoption uh, down and he compared them to, where is the word, is it gerontocracy? Here it is. Sorry, it took me a while to find that. He accused the finance gerontocracy of hindering Bitcoin's progress. Now, when you hear a word like gerontocracy, I mean, I'm not familiar with the word, but I kind of know what it means just in the context of what he's talking about. But, you know, I looked it up just as well uh, to see. And he says, um, well, we learn that a gerontocracy is a form of oligarchical rule in which an entity is ruled by leaders who are significantly older than most of the adult population. And in many political structures, power within the ruling class accumulates with age, making the oldest the holders of the most wealth and power. And, I mean, he's right. That pretty much describes the world today. Describes, of course, um, the hold on the world by the boomers. Um, if you're a boomer, more power to you. I'm not really meaning to pick on the boomers, but, um, you know, uh, you know what I mean, I think. And, um, yeah, 
So Peter Thiel's uh, point, I think, is that um, Bitcoin is it's a young revolution. And I, th I think that's a, a good way of framing it as well. It reminded me of this. So uh, this is slightly morbid. Uh, but did you know that every day 10.4 billion is uh, passed down? To, well, this is just in America. 10.4 billion is passed down from uh, older Americans, boomers really, who pass away and uh, leave leave their wealth to their children every day 10.4 billion is passed down so the argument here is that some of this wealth will make its way into the crypto markets and as the again I don't mean to sound morbid but you know as the boomers do age out shall we say uh, and that wealth does get inherited uh, by Gen X, which is me, shout out to anyone, any of my fellow Gen Xers, we kind of get a rough, uh, we get a rough ride at Generation X, because everyone talks about boomers, everyone talks about millennials, and now, you know, uh, Generation Y, uh, but what about Generation X, Gen X, shout out to Gen X, anyway, so again, this just shows this some of the data, um, I mean, take it with a grain of salt, but I just thought this was uh, interesting, it's just a, a a staggering amount of uh, money is going to be passed down by the boomers uh, to uh, Generation X, Millennials and Gen Y who are statistically much more inclined to store some of their money in crypto. And why? Well, you know, we talk about this because inflation, uh, you know, they can't, uh, there's no point in just sticking your money in the bank with inflation at 8%. Um, you're basically losing 8% a year which is staggering uh, if you hold your money in the bank. So, you know, Bitcoin is a life raft. All right, still still um, at the Bitcoin conference, Jordan Peterson, um, public intellectual, contrarian as well, he cautioned against unbridled enthusiasm uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, so fair enough, I mean, you know, Jordan, he likes to be a contrarian, he likes to go against the tide, and to be honest, he likes to talk. Uh, so, you know, um, he said basically that he was very interested in the idea of a decentralized monetary system, um, but just warned against uh, unexpected um, effects of that system. So if you more uh, really want to hear about uh, what he had to say, well, you can you can watch all of these talks, of course, and I'll show you how to do that in one second. Uh, another data point that came out of the conference was uh, Robin, Robinhood. Um, the, it's a finance, finance app in the US. Um, they've enabled crypto wallets for all of their users, which is uh, good, um, but also uh, they said that Bitcoin is now the number one recurring buy or, you know, dollar cost average approach uh, on the Robinhood app, even ahead of Tesla and Apple. And I thought that's um, that's quite a significant milestone. And it just goes to show again, you know, it's probably Gen X, Millennials and Gen Y who are interested in just buying a bit of Bitcoin every week. Also, yeah, so here's... This is kind of puts it into perspective. This is, um, I think that's Andreas Antonopoulos talking at a Bitcoin conference in 2012. Uh, you can see, you know, you couldn't give away tickets to uh, a crypto conference in 2012. Uh, people would have thought you were very weird if you went along to uh, such a thing. So you can see there's about five people at the conference. Whereas now it's just a massive corporate event and verging on the cusp of going mainstream, if we're honest. And well, we're honest. Yeah, crypto's going mainstream. I think um, that is clear. And so much so that a new NASDAQ survey of uh, financial advisors who control around 26 trillion in assets, apparently 72% of them would be more likely to invest in crypto if a spot ETF were available. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And, you know, of the advisors currently interesting in crypto, 86% of them plan to increase their investment and their ideal allocation is around 6% of their investable portfolio. So, I mean, it all makes sense to me. What this is really is just, you know, bring on the Bitcoin spot ETF. Uh, I'm sure we'll talk about that in future shows. But I think, you know, Gary Gensler, head of the SEC, for various reasons, um, 
has always denied every Bitcoin spot um, application, but there's immense pressure on him to eventually uh, approve one, and I think it's really only a matter of time. It's probably going to be next year, and you know that will potentially open the floodgates to a massive new round of well, investable liquidity really that will go looking for a bit of Bitcoin and crypto. So again, what this says to me is just keep accumulating while you can. Whether or not Bitcoin hits that elusive buy zone, um, any time is a good time to buy uh, if it's before the approval of that spot ETF, maybe. All right, so if you want to dig into everything that was said at the Bitcoin conference, just go to Bitcoin Magazine on YouTube. They've got all of these videos from everyone who was under the sun there. A uh, lot, lot to get through. It'll take you uh, a couple of months to watch it all, uh, but you'll find something that interests you if you so desire. Let's start to finish off, though. Um, and we like to finish on good news. So you thought this is an interesting one. Let's just go to the article. Tesla uh, Block, which is formerly Square, Jack Dorsey's company, and Blockstream are teaming up in Texas. They're building a Bitcoin mining facility that will use uh, solar and battery power uh, powered by Tesla. So... You know, there's a kind of a lot going on here. Um, obviously, uh, Elon Musk is kind of supportive of Bitcoin, but wants it to be powered on, uh, wants Bitcoin mining to run on renewable energy sources. So good to see him put some Tesla resources uh, towards this and, of course, do that in partnership with a block and Blockstream, and interestingly, they're um, they're going to make the, the dashboards of this uh, public, so you'll be able to see um, how much Bitcoin uh, they're actually mining, whether they can make a profit, and how much energy they're using, all that good stuff. So again, just fascinating to watch that all come together. Uh, but in conclusion, I enjoyed this. This is the, did you see this? So this is the um, traditional. Um, Wall Street bull, uh, very handsome. This is a, uh, a upgraded uh, digital a Bitcoin bull from the Bitcoin conference. Pretty handsome. I enjoyed that. All right. Well, that's it really. Um, yeah, bit of a sober look at the markets this week. Um, but, you know, a, a lot can happen in a week. A lot can happen in a month and even more in a year. So I'm sure we'll be back again next week to check in once again, see where we're at and uh, where we're going. Uh, but that's it for today. Thank you very much for watching and we'll see you again uh, next week. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.